us for the Advancing Oceanside podcast. Today, we'll be learning a little bit about the Boys and Girls Clubs of Oceanside, um, but first, a quick word about our sponsor. Tri-City Medical Center's mission is to advance the health and wellness of those they serve, and that starts with primary care for you and your family. Primary care at Tri-City offers a wide range of services close to home, offering preventive care, health screenings, and health education. Tri-City Medical Center is the largest level three NICU in North County. They have a board certified neonatologist available around the clock to care for even the tiniest of patients. As the largest level three neonatal intensive care unit in North County, they know that minutes matter. Tri-City is your source for quality, compassionate care close to home. Visit their website at tricitymed.org or call 855-222-TCMC. That's 855-222-8262. Welcome to the Advancing Oceanside podcast. I'm your host, Scott Ashton, and today we are very excited to have with us Jody Diamond, the CEO of the Boys and Girls Clubs of Oceanside. How are you today, Jody? I'm fantastic. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Great. Well, we want to hear about all the great work that's happening at the Boys and Girls Clubs of Oceanside, but first, we want to hear a little bit about you. Tell us a little bit about yourself and you know what, what brought you to Oceanside. Um, well, I'm a graduate of University of Maryland, so I'm an East Coaster, big Red Sox fan. Sorry for all you uh, Yankee fans out there and Dodger fans, although you're happy this year. A uh, former classroom educator who taught on the East Coast uh, in both the public and private sector, uh, mainly focused with uh, children with learning differences and behavioral, behavioral challenges, uh, and have been in the nonprofit world for 19 years, and more specifically uh, with Oceanside for 14 years. I've uh, been the executive uh, here, the CEO here for the last seven years. Mm-hmm. Great. So uh, 2020 has obviously been a challenging year that's caused us all to find new ways to do things. So um, how, is, how has the Boys and Girls Clubs of Oceanside adapted uh, during this pandemic? What, what are you doing differently? Wow, what a roller coaster of a year. I know all of us want 2020 to end and I am right there with everyone. Um, You know, uh, yes, like many organizations, we had to physically close our uh, our town site clubhouse uh, in March. And we were up and running virtually within days and had contacted all 4,200 youth within that first week and uh, very quickly pivoted to uh, virtual programming, uh, whether it was through Google Hangouts, Facebook, constant contact. We were reaching out to families to ensure that our youth didn't miss any sort of connection with our club. Um, and we s- resorted to old fashioned phone calling as well. You know, when, when we couldn't reach them through other means, we picked up the phone to make sure that we stayed connected. Uh, we began strategizing for reopening our programs literally as soon as we were told we had to close because we knew at some point we were gonna open. And so we knew that we had to have a plan to make that happen. And thankfully we were able to open uh, June 15th for summer camp with very careful strategic plans in place to ensure the health and safety of all kids. We were the only youth development organization to open summer camp in North County and uh, transitioned very quickly to our back to school program on August 17th. We're at um, five, Uh, five sites, including four school campuses, helping to support the uh, distance learning for um, our our Oceanside uh, youth. And um, our roads program, as many of you know, uh, we have an adults with developmental disabilities program that we serve uh, adults with developmental disabilities. And that also had to close back in March. Uh, We are thrilled to be able to report that we've had 100% attendance and we're still having virtual programming for our adults as well. So, you know, really this year has just been such a a dramatic shift from our normal operations, but it definitely did not deter us from ensuring that we were there for the kids. Yeah, and I think that ability to, um, to pivot And I hope we're not saying that word anymore in 2021, but I I think that's a great uh, testimony of your leadership and and the great team that you've put together over the years. And 
you know, my observation is a, a lot of our organizations are going to emerge a lot stronger in the future because of what we've had to go through this year. And I'm, I'm sure that's the case with you guys. Absolutely. Um, can, you, can you share a little bit about your emergency food program? Absolutely. So um, as I mentioned, we made phone calls uh, to our, our kids as soon as you know we closed because we wanted to stay in connection with those that we were not able to reach by other means. And, you know, really what we heard was heartbreaking. Our kids were hungry and we knew we couldn't just sit back and let that happen. Um, so we needed, we knew we needed to do something and we have this commercial kitchen in our Center for Innovation, our culinary arts teaching kitchen. And so my team just swung into action and on May 4th opened a program to serve youth under 18 free home cooked meals curbside uh, and they were nutritious and delicious. And it gave, I think all of us this sense, you know, in the very beginning, we all just wanted to do something, right? We, we really were missing that ability to not only connect with, with our youth, but the ability to, to give. And this food program really supported us in being able to fill our souls and our hearts, but more importantly, to fill a critical need that we were seeing and hearing from our families. Uh, we're really proud to be able to say that we've served over 32,000 free meals uh, to and snacks to uh, anyone under 18. Um, and we're still continuing our curbside pickups. We're serving the kids that are here for the back to school program, as well as continuing our curbside lunches. So we couldn't have done this without the tremendous support initially with uh, Genentech and the Leech Tag Foundation gave us uh, funding to, to start the emergency food program. And so many of those that are listening and our community supporters have helped continue that support. Yeah, we, we definitely have a good um, corporate structure here in this community that is so supportive of our nonprofits. And it's, it's just, it's crushing to think of kids going hungry. So, you know, it's thank you so much for the work that you're doing and to meet those needs. Yeah, I have, I have tremendous staff. Yeah, that's that's what it takes in the nonprofit world, right? It's uh, got to have a good team. Absolutely. So uh, tell us a little bit about your help, how you're helping the kids uh, navigate the whole new concept of distance learning. Well, it's definitely been a challenge for our children, you know, who already were at a disadvantage. Um, you know, we're seeing that academic achievement gap continue to widen. And it's a concern I know that everyone shares. Uh, we're, although we're grateful that we're able to be open uh, and have the highest level of safety precautions in place and, and have had the highest level of safety precautions since June 15th when we initially opened, there are, we were able to serve only 200 youth. Um, at our town site, we can only have 27% of our, our, our normal capacity due to social distancing, et cetera and we're on four school campuses. So as much as we're grateful that we're able to support those uh, kids that are able to come here, we know that there are so many more that, that need that support. We were able to quickly transition from summer camp to the school year and it absolutely took navigating and some challenges and a few hurdles. Uh, that first day of school, we had 96 uh, youth here at our uh, town site location and only two kids had the same teacher. So you can imagine getting all devices up and, and everyone on and kinder all the way up to eighth grade. It was um, needless to say, very interesting. Uh, we, over the next few days, we were able to make it go a little more smoothly and, and were able to work out some of the crinks such as many of the kids didn't have headphones. So mm. again, we're in this quiet space able to have this conversation, but imagine if there were 13 other people also having conversations around us, it would be really distracting. And as a child, how do you begin to even think about learning if you have all this outside, uh, outside um, noise. So thankful to uh, some donors that were able to supply some headphones for us and to help these kids be able to focus, uh, have a little more opportunity to focus. Um, as I mentioned, we're on four school campuses. So that's been really wonderful. 
We know that the school district just went back to school in the hybrid form on November 9th, this past Monday. So uh, we've been able to help transition the kids that have been coming to us since August on school campuses. They've been able to transition back into that hybrid model a little more easily. Okay. Well, so you shared a little bit about the, the technology. What are, what are some of the most important lessons that you've learned in the last seven or eight months? COVID is expensive. <laughs> Exclamation point. <laughs> That's probably the biggest uh, we've learned that, you know, if you can imagine that as, as any business and organization, you know, costs have just become astronomical. Our, our staffing ratios are, are cut in half. So what used to be a one to 20 ratio in some of our, in some of our classrooms are one to 10. So obviously, you know, the staffing costs have gone up. Our program supply lines have increased dramatically. We used to say sharing is caring. We no longer say that. Sharing is not caring. You cannot share your paintbrushes and your crayons or your microscopes and your beakers. Everything has to be individual program supplies. So it's definitely been um, a, a, a huge learning curve in the sense of financial uh, impact. But I would say on the other side of that, and you made mention of this quite recently, I have an extraordinary team and this situation just reinforced that to an even higher level. Not once have I heard any of my team members say, we can't do that, it's COVID, we can't. It has always been, we can't do it that way, but I bet you there's another way. How can we do it? What does that look like? What else can we be doing? There has never been a no before the yes. And I think that is really a testament to this organization and the dedication and devotion that we have to what we do. Um, that has been, we, I say this a lot, we're, we're glass half full kind of people and, and COVID has certainly knocked the wind out of many of our sails. However, the positive side to that, it has brought us together closer as a team and has made us even more dedicated to ensuring that we're reaching these kids because we are seeing the deleterious effect on these kids, whether it's through academics, whether it's through health, whether it's for so socialization, um, we're just seeing some really dramatic impacts and we know we're filling a critical role and we know that there's so much more that we need to be doing. Yeah, absolutely. So we're, we're you know, just weeks away from flipping the calendar to 2021 and, uh, just what are your thoughts as to where you go from here in the in the coming year and beyond? Well, I think it's a very exciting time, and I don't know that people are using that term yet for 2021, but I actually see this as a time that we can make some systemic changes that have been really necessary over decades that we haven't been able to do. And that's starting with the educational system and then looking at how we are providing instruction to our youth and how we as Boys and Girls Club are providing that support. Um, we're seeing some youth that really are, um, are thriving in, in a model that we never would have thought of before. We see other kids that are not. So I think that it will begin to open some critical dialogue to how we can move forward, how we're able to shrink that achievement gap, how we're able to support it in a different way, how we're able to look at the different learning styles and, and adjust as we're you know, navigating kind of this new normal. Um, I, I think that this is a, a, a great time to, to use all of the challenges that we've just faced and turn them into opportunities to begin to have conversations about how we kind of go over those hurdles. Um, I do wanna make mention, and I would be remiss not to in saying that, you know, our community and our supporters are just true heroes. They have stepped up in a way that everyone in Oceanside should be proud. We could never do the work we do without the tremendous support of our superheroes. And uh, I'm grateful at the opportunity to lead this organization. I'm grateful at the opportunity to provide uh, for our community and our youth. And I think that this, this little virus isn't gonna stop us or slow us down. It just may make us do things a little differently, but we still have the passion and dedication to, to forge ahead. Yes, and so you mentioned, um, you mentioned the community support and that's, that's kind of what I wanted to end on. Um, you know, for, the, for those um, of our viewers that are wondering how they can get plugged in, 
um, where, where can they go for more information? They can go to our website, bgcoceanside.org, and check us out. We have the emergency food program that's running, uh, and a lot of people have been really inquiring about how to find the to find where food is. It's free to any member, any child, 18 and under. Do not have to be a resident. Do not have to be a club member. You just have to be someone in need, and, and we're here for you. Uh, but check out our website, our Facebook, um, our Instagram, uh, on our website, it has all that information. Yeah, and uh, you know, you guys are very well recognized for your social media presence. So I've watched that evolve over the years, and you guys have done such a great job with that. Thank you. Well, you you were a great help in in getting us to uh, to get out there too, and so I appreciate uh, all the help that you've always uh, given to us. Um, I. Would also like to, to mention that you know, our efforts to serve our youth during the pandemic uh, did not go unnoticed. And we were recently selected as the 2020 California Nonprofit of the Year uh, by the 76th District Assembly member, Tasha Berner Horvath. So uh, it was such a, a beautiful recognition. We were quite humbled. Um, and the uh, supervisors last, uh, I think October 27th, declared it be Boys and Girls Club of Oceanside Day, so in the county. So that was really awesome. That's fantastic. Congratulations on that. Thank and you. Uh, Jody, thank you for the, the great work that you and your team are doing with the Boys and Girls Clubs of Oceanside. And uh, thank you for taking time to be on our show today. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. All right. Take care.